there was another, there's another person who actually contributed uh, and supported this conference and actually helped Mariam to organize this conference, among many others. But she's actually side by side with Mariam. She's actually helped every step of the way. She's been there to contribute, encourage, and, and advise and support. Mariam Haleluka, please. Where is she? Mariama, Mariama comes from an Algerian, uh, Algeria, from a family who took part the, in the liberation struggle. And she's founder of the woman living under uh, mo mo uh, Muslim uh, laws, and a founder of secularism uh, uh, is a woman's issue. Mariam Hele Lucas, thank you. So I'm not going to tell you about attacks on secularists, because I believe that most of the conference will aim towards giving information on the situation we face in our countries. I uh, will concentrate on attacks on secularism. And I need to start with a few clarifications. One has already been done by Marianne, so I won't get into that. It's the fact that believers can be strong secularists. It's really important. We need a common front. We cannot be divided in the defense of secularism. Now, what is secularism and what it isn't? As a modern concept, we inherited it from the French Revolution. But I want to stress that demands for separation between religions and the political power have been there forever on all continents and in all cultures and in all religions throughout history. And we have to do our homework and do research on that because just like feminists who have been branded, you know, sold out to the West and uh, unauthentic vis-a-vis -vis their culture, secularists are also branded, sold out to the West. It's not the case. We have had demands for separation between state and religions for centuries. So um, going back now to the French Revolution, at the end of the monarchy, the Republic started taking, voting laws to separate religion from the new Republic. As you may uh, have, you may remember that different laws were taken from 1881 and 1886. And then, at the beginning of the century, in 1905 and 1906, France passed laws on total separation between church and the new republic. It corresponds to some sort of evidence which is enclosed in the very etymology of the word, the res publica, addresses everybody, believers, atheists, agnostics. And it cannot favor anybody. So what pertains to some cannot be imposed to all or even privileged by the state. The unity of the population is then based on the fundamental correlation between freedom of conscience and the equality of rights. So we are now into something which is akin to universalism. And let me quote the, the actual law of 1905 in France. Because it says everything even to this day. Article one, Title I, Principles, Section 1, the Republic shall ensure freedom of conscience. It shall guarantee free participation in religious worship, subject only to the restriction laid down hereafter in the interest of public order. Section 2, the Republic may not recognize, pay stipends, or subsidize any religious denomination. Consequently, from January 1, in the year following promulgation of this act, 
all expenditure relating to participation in worship shall be removed from state, region, and municipality budgets. I think we have the foundation of what we now know as secularism. On the one hand, the state guarantees to citizens the freedom to believe and to practice. On the other hand, the state declares itself incompetent in religious matters. It doesn't fall within the state mandate. And therefore, there won't be any recognition of organized religions as political entities with which the state should, should negotiate or dialogue, and the state will not fund any religious activities. It also follows us that the representatives of secular republic do not display any sign of political or religious affiliation. And this is what is known now because it has become problematic due to the pressure of Muslim fundamentalists to change the law. Civil servants in contact with the public are not allowed to display signs of political or religious affiliation. And in secular state schools, which may I remind you, and because we are in the UK, it's very important to remind this, are free compulsory. Uh, pupils and teachers and the administrative personnel of secular state schools similarly are not allowed to display um, signs of religious affiliation. The rationale is that children learn to be equal citizens in the secular republic and not representatives of their communities. And please note, and I'm saying this because the English-speaking media is appallingly bad on reporting on this situation, please note that we are talking about children under age in primary and secondary school. That's all. It does not apply to anyone else. And apart from these two situations, civil servants in contact with the public as representatives of the secular state and children and teachers in secular schools, everybody can practice, everybody can go to mosque, church, temple, and you name it. And you can send your children to religious schools or organize their religious education, etc. So what is secularism is it's a legal provision that defines the relationship between state and religions, organized religions with representatives, and defines the position of the state vis-a-vis -vis organized religions. So we often hear, at least I do, hmm? oh, but secularism didn't end poverty, and secularism didn't end racism, and secularism didn't change the discrimination against women, etc. So secularism is not a solution for all problems, but it's a precondition to many of them. And it only defines the position of the state vis-a-vis -vis organized religions. Secularism is not anti-Islam or anti-Muslims. It was passed in 1905, where there was no immigration from Muslim countries in France. So please, English-speaking media, just do your homework and don't <laughs> spread out false information. And finally, what blurs a little bit the situation is that under Sarkozy, the right-wing uh, president at that time in France, there was a new law passed in, 19, in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, for electoral reasons, because he was courting the extreme right vote before um, running for president again. There was absolutely no need for this new law. So it's entirely for an electoral reason that he did, he did it. Because applying the 1905 and 1906 sets of laws was plenty to prevent Muslim fundamentalists to impose a change in the law. But it's in keeping with all his other attempts to undermine secularism. 
Anyway, nobody seemed to realize that this new law actually weakens the 1905 law. Because the 1905 law say, says that any sign of religious affiliation is not allowed for civil servants and, and pupils and teachers. While this new law says that only ostentatious signs should be banned. So this is actually weakening the first law. And ostentatious, of course, opens the door to interpretation, while the first wording didn't. Now, attacks for secularism, on secularism have been going on for a century. But it was led by the church, the Catholic Church and the Vatican. And now, that is the ch big change. It's mostly led by Muslim fundamentalists. But it is followed immediately by and supported by Catholic authorities or Jewish authorities. And we also witnessed a very unholy alliance between the right, the extreme right, and all the religious forces from different religions together. So there's, there's a tax target democracy. And I would just uh, quote the second in command of the Islamic Salvation Front in Algeria, Ali Belhaj, who before the cancellation of the elections, media, please note, because that's also a false information which is circulated before the elections were canceled in Algeria, he said to an international press a meeting, if one has the law of God, why should one want the law of the people? One should kill all these unbelievers. In other words, we are switching from democracy to theocracy. And the law of God, quote unquote, as interpreted by fundamentalists, is now supposed to become the law of the land. And may I point at the fact that this is ahistorical, unchangeable, while the law of the people can change and improve, hopefully, with vote of the people. And this is the essence of democracy, which is at stake now. And also note that the law allows, the law permits, the law doesn't force anybody to use it, in a sense. For instance, if reproductive rights are granted by the law of the people, it doesn't force the Catholic women to use contraception or have abortion. It allows us all, but it doesn't force them. Similarly, if the law of the people allows equal access to, to inheritance to women, for instance, it doesn't force believing Muslims to accept the inheritance. They can gift the, their share of inheritance to their brothers if they so want. So we are actually uh, talking of a situation in which a minority will deprive all citizens in the name of their beliefs of universal rights. And there are also signs which I want to point at, which are verbal attacks on secularism. For instance, and I heard it a lot from the European left, the term coined is now secular fundamentalists. As if in secular countries, anybody could be stoned, for instance, for wearing a veil. While in non-secular Muslim countries, you can be stoned or killed otherwise for not wearing the veil. So it is extremely dangerous and especially heartbreaking when it comes from the left to hear terms like secular fundamentalists. But also, and this is throughout Europe, plural secularism, open secularism, all of them trying to undermine the very concept. The most successful attack against secularism has been the shift of meaning from separation between state and church at the time, but religion in general, to equal tolerance by the state 
of all religions. Neutrality of the state vis-a-vis -vis all religions. So the state should not favor one religion over another one, but the state recognizes religions as political entities and recognizes its representatives as people with whom the state has to negotiate and dialogue. And in many instances in Europe, certainly, the state funds religions. Now, I think this shift is a major loss for us and we need to counter it as much as we can because this is the new definition which prevails nearly everywhere now. For instance, in the UK, of course, where the head of the state is also the head of the Anglican Church, so how can we speak of separation? But also in Germany, or where the lenders, the different states within the federal state of Germany, collect religious taxes and redistributes to various religions the, the taxes. Or in the US, you know, in God we trust, and you go to court and you swear on the Bible. So there is no separation. So it's really the definition of equal tolerance which is now prevailing, not just in Europe, but in all the former colonies. And I think it's very important for us to realize that. You know, throughout Asia and Africa, we see the results of adopting this definition, probably through uh, the former British Empire of equal tolerance. This is what actually breeds communalism. It's at the root of co communalism. Different rights, different laws for different categories of citizens. So citizens are not equal before the law anymore. And this, of course, leads to uh, cultural relativism. Moreover, this is the definition, equal tolerance, which is supported, and for very different reasons, but all the same, supported by the European Union. Uh, there's an enormous pressure on France, for instance, to change its 1905 law. And uh, the European Court of Human Rights regularly uh, condemned France for not changing the law. But also at the UN level, where we have the lobbying of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, the OIC. And I have no time to speak to that, but do look on your website uh, at the Universal Islamic Declaration of Human Rights. It's absolutely appalling that this has now been considered and recognized at the level of the UN. But also, and that breaks my heart because I'm of the generation of the Bandung uh, meeting of the non-aligned, the non-aligned have repeatedly sided with fundamentalists in the name of anti-imperialism, as if secularism was not indigenous and we need to prove that it was indigenous and for centuries. And it's not a Western concept. And also human rights organizations. We hear now regularly in all meetings of Sikh human rights, Muslim human rights, not universal human rights anymore. And the left and the far left, certainly in Europe, but also in other countries in Asia and Africa, who support Muslim fundamentalists and their demands and the new transformed definition of secularism in the name of anti-imperialism. And it's not just in Europe, but if you look at India today and the Modi uh, government of the Hindu right, you will see that you have exactly the same pattern. The left, generally speaking, fails to recognize the political nature of the forces against secularism as extreme right political forces, not as religious forces. And there's a particular mention to be made regarding Muslim fundamentalism because they don't have such problem with Christian fundamentalism or Jewish fundamentalism, but Muslim fundamentalism is something nobody wants to touch. Nobody has the courage. 
Let me briefly point at what Muslim fundamentalism has in common, and I'm not here trying to draw parallels further than what I'm going to say. I don't think everything can be compared to fascism, but in the ideology of Muslim fundamentalism, we find things which are very much akin to fascism and Nazism. For instance, the belief that there is not a superior race, but a superior creed. It's not the Aryan race anymore, but it is Islam as the best possible religion. The reference to a mythical past to justify superiority. So it's not the ancient Rome, but it is the golden age of Islam. And it leads to the right and duty to physically eradicate the untermensch and the kofir in our own context, the unbelievers. And like Nazis and fascists, they are pro-capitalist and they keep women in their place, which is the kitchen, the church, <laughs> change to mosque, and the cradle. With the abandonment of secularism, we are seeing communalism to replace universalism, communities to replace citizenship, theocracy to replace democracy, and the fragmentation of the people into smaller and smaller entities. And the worst attacks, I'm not going to expand on that, not only because I, it's time for me to stop, is of course the fundamentalist religious right, which uses this new definition of secularism and the communalist interpretation of, of it to push their political agenda, but also, more recently, certainly in Europe, but I can see it also in South Asia. The traditional xenophobic far right, like the National Front in France or the Hindutva in India, using, secu co-opting secularism, and we have to be very, very careful about this new threat which is developing now, to prevent some communities to develop their demands, but to use the dominant community to impose their view of what should be democracy in their countries. Sorry, I have been a bit long. <laughs>